Good Friday, Freedom. We want to especially welcome all of our guests. We're so glad that you joined us for this uh, Friday communion service. And um, I will go ahead and say, you're going to hear it again. I hope you'll come back and join us for the rest of the story on Easter morning, Sunday. Throughout this past six weeks, we've been covering the book of Mark. And tonight, we are going to pick up in chapter 15 at verse 1. And we're going to be reading Jesus before Pilate. Mark 15, verse 1. Very early in the morning, the chief priest with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus and they led him away and they handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priest accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurgents who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release you? The king of Jews asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, and then they twisted him together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff, and they spit on him. 
Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes to him. Then they led him out to crucify him. For us, he does this on our behalf. For his love for us that he did this. Tonight, we will uh, partake in communion and remember and just try to grasp what Jesus Christ did on our behalf. We're going to pause now and we're going to pray and then we're going to continue to worship. Will you stand and pray with me? And let's just, together, let's just say the name Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, may our praise bring you glory and remind us of your promise. We love you, Lord. We seek your presence and we worship you and you alone. Father God, we come before you today laying down our pride and our arrogance and, our, and we just confess our need for you. Father, we pray tonight that many will have life in Jesus' name because what he has done, what he alone has done for our sake. And Adonai, as we meditate on your great sacrifice for mankind, we pray that many around the world will believe that you are the Son of God. And through believing this in faith, we'll have life in that name. We're humbled when we think of you and how you voluntarily surrendered yourself for the sins of all, that your love excels all others. Lord, may we dedicate ourselves to love as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Look over at your neighbor and say, welcome to the choir, because you're all in the choir tonight. These songs that we're going to play, they're not going to be new to you, so if you would, remain standing and just praise with us. On the hill far away stood an old rugged cross
continue uh, in Mark chapter 15 with the crucifixion of Jesus. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see which, what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified him with, with him with two rebels, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so, you are going to destroy the temple and build it back in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saves others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabarathon, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near him heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah's. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave them alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down now, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women, some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So at that evening, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear this, that, that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked if Jesus was, had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of a rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Please turn your attention to the screens now. Why is Good Friday good? Good Friday is good because the price we couldn't pay got paid and the stain we couldn't clean got clean. Good Friday is good because the world was without hope, but the lamb was without blemish. Good Friday is good because the worst thing that could ever happen was simultaneously the best thing that would ever happen. Good Friday is good because on that cross, on that day, the great shepherd of the sheep walked through the valley of the shadow of death for us. Good Friday is good 
Because even though the cross isn't pretty, it's beautiful. Good Friday is good because if we have a king who would rather die for his enemies than kill them, Good Friday is good because I am not good, but he is. Good Friday is good because Friday is not the end of the story. Good evening, and again, welcome. Glad you could be a part of uh, tonight here at Freedom. Uh, This is always a little bit of a different service. Uh, There's a time and place for us to learn new things, but there are other times that aren't at all about learning new things. They're about rehearsing and remembering the most important things. And that's what today and tonight are all about. It's not about learning new stuff. It's about remembering the most important events in all of history. And certainly this weekend is about the focal point of all of history. History is, in fact, his story. God is the ultimate author, and the story that he tells, the story that he has authored, is one in which he loves to use foreshadowing in really striking ways. And there's probably no better example of how God loves to use foreshadowing than what he did with Passover. Jesus loved the Passover. In fact, the scriptures tell us that he longed to have one more opportunity to share Passover with his closest circle of friends. And it's not coincidental at all that the events of this week happened at Passover. Because Passover was the ultimate foreshadowing of the the great event. In Passover, we have this story that's really our story. A people who were in bondage who truly were slaves in a situation that they were completely helpless and hopeless to ever get out of. There was no way they could break free from the bondage that they were living in in Egypt. And God saw their plight, and God acted on their behalf. And the whole story of of what happened to bring about their deliverance is a good reminder that the deliverance that God brings... The setting and order of things that God did and will do, it involves some scary stuff because it involves the wrath of God being poured out. There was some bad stuff that had to happen in the course of the plagues. There there was some pouring out that had to happen in order for freedom to follow. And it ultimately came to a head with that final plague on the night of the Passover, the initial passing over, And God had to give some very specific instructions for how this would take place. In order for his people to be free, they had to do something very specific. You remember that part of the story? In every home, there had to be a lamb slaughtered. There had to be the shedding of blood in every single home. And not only did the lamb have to be slaughtered, you remember the two things that had to happen. This is important to remember because it's such an important picture of a reality that has to be true for us. First of all, the blood of the lamb had to be applied. Do you remember that part? Around and over the door. The blood had to be there so that the angel of death would see that and would know this is a protected place. The wrath of God has no place in this home. And he would move on. The blood had to be applied, but do you remember the other half of the deal? The lamb had to be consumed. They had to eat the lamb. And the importance of that was God was about to set them free, but they were going on a journey that was going to be a a big deal. It was going to to stretch them to the limit, and they were going to need the lamb on the inside to sustain them for the journey that would begin the next day. Tell me that is not a great picture of the great reality that we experience, that both of those things have to happen for us. First of all, the lamb has been slain, and, and we celebrate that. We, we remember that tonight, and we celebrate on Sunday the victory that was won through the death of the perfect, sinless lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. But it's not enough that we remember that the lamb was slain. Two more things have to happen. The blood has to be applied, 
and we have to have the lamb on the inside. It's a great reminder that it's not enough just to know and remember that the Son of God died. That's a historical fact. But the blood has to be applied. In order for us to do us any good, we have to ask that Jesus' blood be applied to our sins. We have to let go of the notion that we're going to get good enough to deserve the favor of God or that we're going to work hard enough to break free from sin's grip. We have to just by simple faith trust that the blood of Jesus that was shed for us can be applied to our account and just through simple faith the blood in a sense is applied so that our sins are washed completely white and then the second half of that transaction the receiving part. We, we don't just get a clean slate. We receive the Lamb of God to live inside of us. We need the Lamb on the inside to sustain us for the journey, don't we? Well, that, that's what this is all about. Jesus longed one more time, one final time, to do this thing that the Jewish people had been celebrating for centuries. Together once again to remember the acts of God for the deliverance of his people. It was a big deal for him one last time to be at the table with his closest friends and to remember what God had done on behalf of his people. It's a picture of the love of God. And on that night, Jesus gave it new meaning. He took bread, and in the, as a part of that meal that they had shared every year, he broke the bread, and he said something that had to just completely take the disciples aback. He, he said, this is my body, and it's broken for you. And after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. He told them to eat the bread, consume my body. It's a picture again. You're going to need the lamb on the inside. You're going to need me living in you, sustaining you. You're going to need my blood covering you. It's interesting that he said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. You know, there aren't many things that have continued perpetually for 2,000 years. I mean, think about how many things you can name that have gone on perpetually in humanity, in any part of human culture, for 2,000 years. The church has faithfully practiced this around the globe for 2,000 years, and it's changed hardly any at all. I said God, in the telling of his story, loves foreshadowing. Jesus did too. He told us to hold on to this to do this until he comes back. I love what he's foreshadowing with what we share together tonight. Because it's not just a real tangible thing that helps us to remember and give thanks for what Christ has done, but it's a foreshadowing of what's to come. Think of all the different symbols and practices that Jesus could have given us as ways of remembering what he did at the cross. I mean, I can think of a number of things that he could have done as reminders and he said, here's the one that I want you to, to lay hold of, the table. That's kind of odd, isn't it? We're remembering this incredibly violent event, and yet the way that he wants us to remember it is in such a, a comfortable and familiar way, such a relational way, I want you to come to the table. Oh, that's a beautiful foreshadowing of the fact that that what Jesus is inviting us to and what he's preparing us for is this wonderful intimacy that we get to start having now, but it's just a little glimpse, it's just a little taste of what is to come. That to know him is to prepare for a day when we get to share in the great feast 
the great, great banquet table of Jesus, oh, it's going to be a blast. Jackie laughs at me because I get excited about what's, gonna, what's awaiting us, the intimacy with Jesus at the table. It says there's going to be fine wine and sweet meat at that table. I'm not much of a wine drinker, but I like the sound of sweet meat at the table with Jesus. It's a, I mean, don't you love those times that you get with people that you love and you break bread and you, you feast on the food, but you feast on on what you share together. This is what Jesus has invited us to, from a place of bondage to a place of fellowship and love. And so tonight, as we remember, there's a sense of heaviness because we remember the incredibly high price that Jesus paid. It was with his death, it was with his pain and his shed blood that our freedom was purchased. But he didn't do that for us so that we could go around spending the rest of our lives with long faces and moping and feeling gloomy about that. He did it so that we could be free, so that we could know love, acceptance, joy, and fellowship. So tonight as we come to the table to receive, we sing as we come. And we come with hearts that are expectant to receive because that's the heart of Jesus. He wants you tonight to leave this place full of of the lamb you're going to get a little wafer and you're going to get a little cup but i hope you're going to get more than a little bread and a little juice i hope you're going to get a lot of jesus because that's what he came to do he came to give us life to give us himself and to give that in abundance and so we invite you tonight whatever your background whatever your affiliation if you belong to jesus come and receive come and enjoy the table together would you join me as we turn to him together in prayer right now? Lord Jesus, we come with hearts that are so overwhelmed with great, just gratefulness and joy at knowing that you love us and that you've gone to such great lengths to show us your love and to make a way for us to be forgiven and to belong. Throughout this room, we just say thank you we love you. We welcome you. We invite you tonight. Make yourself known in this place. Come and fill our hungry hearts tonight with more of you, with more of your life. Lord Jesus, we pause to remember what you've done for us. And we give you thanks for your love, for your courage, for your sacrifice, and for your victory. Holy Spirit, would you now minister life to each of us as we receive? Would you impart grace, more of the heart and life and love of Jesus to us as we come to receive now? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to stand together. We're going to continue to worship in song. And uh, no one's going to prompt you. Just when you're ready, you can come forward to receive. We'll serve on each side of the room. And if you will, just when... Eight or ten of you have come forward to make a semicircle to receive. Once you've been served, uh, those who are serving will pray with you, and then you can receive the elements and return to your seats, and we'll just do this in a context of worship. So let's stand together now. Oh, 
Good Friday always has a real somber feel to it, and it should. But you know, there's a point in time when you just need to pause and acknowledge we can't look back to Good Friday without looking through Resurrection Sunday to look back that far. So as believers, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, but we also remember it may be Friday, but Sunday is coming, and we just need to get a little taste of Sunday before we get out of here. So on these last two, let's just go ahead and get a head start on celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Just go ahead and kick it up a gear for these last two. These aren't too revved up now. By the way, the choir sounds amazing tonight. With, with uh, fewer people, I can hear every one of y'all. Some of y'all I need to talk to. Now. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for Oh, yeah. 
darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. So from heaven you came wrong, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word from the throne of endless glory. Thanks so much for coming tonight. I hope you will make plans to be back Sunday morning at 10 o'clock when we celebrate the resurrection. I'm sure you've probably heard by now, but those of you who've got kids, our uh, family spring fun event for tomorrow has had to be postponed by a week because it's outdoors and the weather's going to be inclement. So we'll do that at Stone and Caroline's a week from tomorrow. Be praying for a great harvest on Sunday. Invite your neighbors. We look forward to seeing you then. Thanks for coming. Have a good night. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I surely hope that what you heard was relevant and helpful and above everything. I hope that what you experienced today really helped your heart to connect with the heart of God. Now, if what you heard uh, for you stirred up any questions or maybe led you toward uh, some type of spiritual decision, maybe you want to talk with someone about something that's on your mind, I would love to hear from you. And so I would encourage you, 
reach out by email. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address. It's mark at myfreedomchurch.net. That's not going to go to a secretary or an assistant. That will come directly to me. I'd love to hear from you and talk with you about anything that's on your mind. And if in the future you're in our area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at Freedom Church. But until then, we invite you to access all of the sermon material that you find online. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Hope that you have a great day.